Hello, I'm Jim Burnett. This third program in our series, NASA and Aeronautics, is Strides Toward the Future. It is the 60s, one of the most progressive decades of this century. The world spotlight is on NASA as they pursue their goal of putting a man on the moon. However, while most of the attention is directed toward the space program, NASA is also working at advancing the area of aeronautics. In this program, we examine several short films that illustrate NASA's efforts to improve the technology of aviation. For now, we look at a film dealing with a new type of plane that NASA has developed. This plane has some of the characteristics of a helicopter. Then we look at a film about wind tunnels and their influence on aircraft design. This craft speeds along like an airplane and takes off and lands like a helicopter. It's the X-14A, one of an unusual class called V-STAL, having many possible applications for the future. V-STAL stands for Vertical or Short Takeoff and Landing, and testing of these experimental planes is being carried out at NASA's Langley and Ames Research Centers. In addition to jet-supported aircraft, investigations are being made on propeller-driven planes. This one is called the DOK. Here, the bell tilt rotor. And the Ryan short takeoff and landing plane. Craft with these characteristics could carry passengers to metropolitan areas from outlying airports in a fraction of the time it now takes. And the military has many potential uses for such planes. Part airplane, part helicopter, these V-Stall craft may one day revolutionize our present-day concept of air travel. Here's a scaled-down version of the Apollo spacecraft, which will carry astronauts to the moon. Like nearly all the air and spacecraft before Apollo, it is tested in wind tunnels. Wind tunnels are ground facilities which tell engineers how well a craft will perform before it becomes airborne. By passing air over models at varying speeds, it's possible to duplicate almost every in-flight condition. The pilot of this plane was confident when he went into a spin that the wings would not be torn off. Well in advance of the actual flight, exhaustive tests like this one in a spin tunnel at the Langley Research Center determined how much stress a plane could take in a spin situation. This same facility, which tested fighter planes during World War II, now tests models of the Apollo spacecraft. Across the country, another research center, Ames, has been involved in wind tunnel investigations for over two decades. Here, in the largest wind tunnel in the world, full-scale planes and space vehicles are tested. Research facilities like these come in many shapes and sizes. They can duplicate everything from spacecraft re-entry down to the landing speed of conventional airplanes. Wind tunnels contributing to our safety in the air and shaping future craft yet to fly. Now we find ourselves in the autumn of 1965. In this next film, NASA researchers are attempting to alter a plane so it can land with less runway. Then in the following film, we take a look at some of the additional aeronautical projects NASA is involved in. As planes are built bigger and fly faster, they have tended to need longer runways. This high-speed jet, for instance, is making a normal landing approach at 155 miles per hour. Modifying a plane so it can land with less runway is the basis for a research study undertaken by NASA. One solution is to blow air from the plane's engines over highly deflected flaps, allowing the pilot to slow the plane down. So that the system can be tested under all flight conditions, the pilot wears a hood to simulate an instrumented landing. On the ground, radar furnishes tracking information. Even noise problems associated with the operation are studied. If everything is favorable, the pilot proceeds visually to touchdown. The flights continue, touchdown, evaluation, and around again. Boundary layer control gives the pilot 25% more time to react during the critical landing phase. Studies like these at NASA's Langley and Ames Research Centers may well benefit airlines, passengers, and communities of the future. For 
over 50 years, NASA and its predecessor, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, have performed much of the aeronautical research in the United States. The birth of new concepts as a result of theory must be followed by extensive full-scale tests. NASA's Flight Research Center, located at Edwards, California, was established in 1947 for this purpose. One of the center's major programs is the X-15. The X-15 is a research aircraft being used to gather information about man and materials at high-speed, high-altitude flight. The data from this research program will help build the airplanes and space vehicles of the future. In addition to the normal aerodynamic research, studies are underway for the design of a supersonic transport. In cooperation with the Air Force, flight engineers at Edwards have installed new instrumentation into the giant XB-70. The 185-foot-long plane is designed to fly at 2,000 miles per hour, three times the speed of sound. Many of the research craft which have been flown only on paper and in wind tunnels are actually flown at Edwards. This one, called the M2 lifting body, has no wings at all. The body of the craft is shaped in such a way that it doesn't need wings. Right now, a vehicle returning from space must be recovered from the ocean or drift down on land by parachute. But scientists are trying to design a craft which can fly a space mission, return through the Earth's atmosphere, and then land like an airplane. It is toward this end that NASA is studying lifting bodies. This test pilot is climbing into another machine, a machine which is helping prepare men to land on the moon. Called the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle, it can duplicate many of the features of a lunar craft, including one-sixth gravity. Both the piloting and operational procedures of manned lunar landings are being studied. Whether flying to the fringes of the Earth's atmosphere, paving the way for a supersonic transport, studying spacecraft that can fly like a plane, or solving the problems of landing on the moon, the flight research of today will affect our air and space travel of tomorrow. 1966 has arrived and NASA struggles with the dangerous problem of hydroplaning. This first film showcases some of the discoveries NASA has made in coping with this hazard. In the second film, we take a further look at NASA's progress in developing vertical takeoff planes. Speedboat enthusiasts and water skiers experience a phenomenon known as hydroplaning as they skim along the water. This same hydroplaning can occur on wet or rain-drenched runways and highways, spelling trouble for pilot and driver alike. At NASA's Langley Research Center, engineers have been studying the problem. A sled carrying the landing gear of an airplane moves along a test track at velocities duplicating actual landing speeds. In total hydroplaning, the tire is lifted completely off the pavement, skimming along on top of the water. At this point, brakes become ineffective. Under certain conditions, even the automobile is susceptible to hydroplaning. It's like driving on ice. The aeronautical research also shows that tires should not be underinflated, that added weight on tires does not diminish hydroplaning, that a smooth tire is more susceptible to hydroplaning than a deeply treaded one, and that possibly grooving pavement surfaces could help alleviate the problem. Basic aeronautical research, identifying tire hydroplaning as a hazard and suggesting possible solutions not only for airplanes but for automobiles as well. V-Stall, that's the name for vertical or short takeoff and landing craft. Planes which can take off and land with little or no runway and yet fly forward at conventional speeds. What you see here are research craft, forerunners of future intercity transports. Both jet planes and propeller driven craft are being tested. Generally, a prop powered V-Stall would be used for short hauls, jets for the longer flights. All have one thing in common. They can take off and land like a helicopter. Change to forward flight and then speed along like an airplane. 
This four-engine version, shown in a wind tunnel, is now undergoing flight tests by the Air Force as a transport. For several years, NASA's Langley and Ames Research Centers have been involved in the study of V-stalls. These studies have included many hours of wind tunnel testing, both with models and full-scale planes. This is the British Hawker Strike Fighter, in one of the tests being conducted in cooperation with European countries. An international organization called Advisory Group Aerospace Research and Development, AGARD, has been set up as a clearinghouse for V-stall information. The British have another plane, the SC-1. Both it and the Hawker have been flown by NASA test pilots. Here, the French entry, the Balzac, and a prototype built by Germany. Modifications are being made on many variations of V-Stall so that eventually specifications can be laid down for a whole class of vertical takeoff planes. Their uses may range from rescue work to intercity transportation. V-Stall, a new breed of craft being studied here and abroad by government and industry. Research today for tomorrow's aircraft. In this next film, NASA is working on a system capable of landing helicopters in bad weather conditions. In the second film, we visit the 1967 Paris Air Show. This event displays the results of technological advances that NASA has made. In aeronautics, NASA is continuing to seek an all-weather landing system for helicopters and the new vertical and short landing craft. At Langley Research Center in Virginia, test pilots are carrying out blind landing studies, testing out new instrumentation and displays. To simulate blind landing conditions, the left seat is shielded with amber plastic. When combined with a blue visor, the pilot is unable to see outside the cockpit. Ground-based radar and computers provide signals to the airborne instruments and make them operate. These include air and ground speed, range, height, and vertical speed indicators. Right now, helicopters and even commercial airlines cannot land their craft if there's a cloud ceiling lower than 200 feet. Using these experimental displays, the test pilots were able to narrow this distance down to 50 feet. Significant research toward the day when all aircraft can land under zero visibility conditions. Paris, France. One of the highlights of the recent Paris Air Show was the visit of President Charles de Gaulle to the U.S. Pavilion. Also attending were astronauts David Scott and Michael Collins, who looked at Russian hardware and met with their USSR counterpart, cosmonaut Nikolai Belayev. The Paris Air Show, governments and industry displaying the results of technological advances. Closer to home, Montreal, Canada, Expo 67, still in progress. The United States Pavilion is a geodesic dome rising 20 stories. One of the biggest drawbacks to jet engines is the substantial noise that accompanies them. In this next film, we see the measures taken by NASA to cope with this problem. After that, we watch a film where NASA conducts some free flight research. In this segment, a model airplane is used for spin tests. A major effort is underway to help reduce the noise of commercial airliners. One part of this effort is taking place at the Oakland, California International Airport. The tests are being supervised by NASA's Ames Research Center. A specially equipped Boeing 707 jet is being used to make the studies. Inside the plane, analog computers can make the giant transport fly like other kinds of planes and simulate different weight loads. Outside on the wings, oversized flaps and lift control devices help the pilot increase his angle of approach to an airport. Using this improved control system, the plane can fly about twice as high above the ground during the early approach to the runway, thus reducing ground noise. At NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia, model airplanes are serious business. 
highly instrumented craft like this one can be put through the most rigorous tests without endangering the life of a test pilot or losing a valuable plane. When the instrumentation checkout is completed, a parachute is placed under the tail so the model can be recovered for additional flights. Next, the model is carefully mounted on a helicopter. Today's test calls for a drop from about 5,000 feet. Meanwhile, the tracking and radio controlling gear has moved into position. Four men operate these converted 50 caliber machine gun mounts, two trackers and two pilots. The trackers always keep the model in sight as it drops. The pilots each have radio control boxes on their laps. One man controls the model's pitch and wing sweep, while the other operates the rudder and ailerons. During this test, the model is allowed to dive or fall until it is simulating flight speeds. Then, the radio controllers on the ground pull out and stall the model to see if it goes into a spin. They have about 25 seconds to complete their maneuvers before the main parachutes deploy, lowering the model gently to the ground. Radio controlled drops like these help prove out planes of the future with today's research. It is the spring of 1968, and in this film we get to see a preview of one of NASA's most famous projects, the X-15. Then our second film gives us a further look at NASA's efforts to neutralize the problems of hydroplaning. <laughs> Twice in the last six weeks, this man flew the rocket-powered X-15 at close to five times the speed of sound. He is NASA test pilot Bill Dana, a civilian research pilot engineer. Data gathered by the X-15 will be applied to fast-flying vehicles of the future. Test pilot Dana describes what it's like. A typical flight, of course, starts under the wing of the B-52 mothership. and. Uh, uh, under the wing of this mothership, we fly some 250 miles uh, north into Nevada, uh, turn around and launch off the mothership toward Edwards. Uh, the rocket engine is lit immediately after departing the mothership, uh, at which time we establish our climb attitude, and depending on the profile, whether it's a space uh, control research mission, or a heating mission, or a high-speed mission, uh, fly for a period in the climb to the desired altitude, at which time we push back over to level flight. Uh, burnout can either occur during the climb or uh, after the push over to level flight. Uh, the engine runs uh, less than a minute and a half, and uh, from that time we coast uh, the re remaining 200 miles back to Edwards for a powerless landing at the dry lake at Edwards. X-15 Research, testing out design, structures, and pilot performance for tomorrow's high-speed air travel. Hydroplaning, a phenomenon causing tires to skim along a runway like water skis. It can also happen to your car. For several years, NASA has been studying hydroplaning. Special test areas like this landing loads track have helped engineers determine the problems associated with landing under various runway conditions. It has been found, for instance, that by cutting grooves in runways and highways to allow the water to run off, a pilot or driver has better control. Already more than a half dozen airports around the country have grooved runways. To find out how effective runway grooving is, this big 990 jet has made landing after landing on various runway surfaces, ranging from water-soaked to those covered with slush and ice. Recently at Wallops Island, Virginia, NASA engineers began a series of tests to come up with a system for predicting how aircraft brakes will perform on wet or slushy runways before landing. A system which could be applied to highways as well. The testers were joined by many other government and industry people interested in skid research. A future system might work like this. A specially equipped car would drive down an airport runway at approximately the landing speed of an incoming plane. Its recording devices would show if the plane could land safely without skidding. 
A similarly equipped test car could also give highway officials more effective advance notice of skidding conditions. Right now, data from both the airplane and automobile tests are being correlated. The results may one day make airport runways and highways safer. Now, in this next clip, we observe NASA working on flight simulators. These simulators enable NASA to make improvements on planes without leaving the ground. After that, our final film shows us the latest developments NASA has made in their work on vertical takeoff planes. Although it may look like a typical aircraft landing, the pilot never left the ground. This is a takeoff and landing simulator at NASA's Ames Research Center near San Francisco. It is one of several such devices which closely duplicate the motion and feel of a plane in flight. It works like this. A closed circuit color television system incorporated into a scanner moves across a mock-up of an airport approach and runway showing the pilot what he would see if he were really making the landing. The color image is projected on a screen mounted in front of the simulator cab, giving the pilot a very realistic view as he approaches to land. The entire system is controlled by and tied into computers. Every move the pilot makes, every motion of the aircraft is recorded for study. Computer is ready for run one. Okay, here we go. At Ames, modern simulators are essentially a research tool. The primary purpose is not to teach the pilot, but to learn from him. From these simulators will come the refinement of aircraft design and improvements in handling okay, quality. That looks good. Reset. Take a look at this thumb control, designed to control the spoilers on a plane's wings, causing the aircraft to ascend and descend. Normally operated by a lever beside the throttles, the small thumb control made it easier to handle the plane both in flight and during landing. After being thoroughly tested in simulator runs, the small device was installed on a big 990 jet. When the spoilers were lowered using the thumb control, the aircraft ascended. When raised, it descended again. The response was prompt and the system worked well, confirming the results of the ground test. Aircraft simulators, helping make improvements on planes in use today and laying the basic research groundwork for aircraft of the future. Planes that rise vertically, the same as a helicopter, then fly forward like a conventional airplane. Called VTOL, they are a unique class of vertical takeoff and landing plane craft that may one day play an important role in short-haul air transportation. This VTOL, the XV-5B, is one of several planes undergoing flight tests at NASA research centers in California and Virginia. To supply the lift needed to take off, hover, and land vertically, the XV-5B makes use of two five-foot diameter fans submerged in the wings. When landing or taking off, the fan covers are opened. When closed, the exhaust is directed out the tailpipes and the plane can fly forward at high speed like a conventional jet aircraft. Designated the XC-142, this VTOL was developed from NASA wind tunnel tests which began in 1956. The XC-142 rises vertically by tilting up its wings and engines. Once in the air, the wing is tilted down for forward flight. Studies on this particular plane are centered around VTOL landings in terminal areas when there is poor visibility. From an engine producing 15,000 pounds of thrust, the Hawker P1127 VTOL literally rises and descends on a pillar of jet exhaust. This same engine can then push the plane forward at subsonic speeds. The P-1127 is being used to study approach and landing tasks and to train NASA test pilots for other VTOL programs. Vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Research now to determine their future potential as short-haul intercity transports. In the four-year period we have looked at, NASA has made consistent headway in improving the performance of aircraft. 
through their research on hydroplaning, vertical takeoff planes, and other projects, NASA can look back at the 60s as an era of progress. Next week, we bring you a special program on the X-15, which we've already discussed briefly. Till next week, this is Jim Burnett.